Good morning and a happy and blessed Sabbath to everyone. May God richly bless you as you worship with us today. Our thought for meditation is taken from Ellen G. White's writings, Sons and Daughters, page 347. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. See Titus 2, 12, and 13. Do not allow trifling things to absorb your time and attention. Keep your mind on the glorious themes of the Word of God. Now is the time to watch and pray, to put away all self-indulgence, all pride, and all selfishness. The precious moments that are now, by many worse than wasted, should be spent in meditation and prayer. On Christ's coronation day, he will not acknowledge as his any who bear spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but to his faithful ones, he will give crowns of immortal glory. May this reading be a blessing to us all and a happy Sabbath to you all.
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we humbly approach the throne of grace and appeal to the mercy and righteousness and justice of our Savior, Redeemer, Advocate, Mediator, and as well as the Judge. We trust your wisdom. We trust your love for us. Can you trust us? is the question we need to answer. Can you trust us to be genuine custodians of your law as commandment keepers and covenant keepers, especially the Sabbath commandment that contains the seal of God's authority as the creator of heavens and earth in six days. Help us to understand you so that we do not ignorantly or intentionally pollute the Sabbath as your people have done from the very beginning, causing distress, causing pain, causing sorrow, and causing God really to do things that he didn't want to do in order to awaken them. Help us to learn these lessons. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is based on the, the um, it's called My Life Today. It's a devotional, and I've adopted portions of this to uh, look back at the year that has passed in order to face the new year. Another year of our lives in the calendar closest day. How can we look back at, upon it? Have we made advancement in the divine life? Have we crucified flesh with affections and the lusts? Have we an increased interest in the study of God's word? Have we gained decided victories over our own feelings and our wayward, waywardness? All what has been the record of our lives for the year which has now passed into eternity, never to be recalled as we face the new year. So as you and I enter upon this new, this incoming year, let us make earnest resolutions. One is to have our life course resolutely turned towards, onward and upward. That is to become more spiritually elevated and exalted than it has been hitherto in overcoming all our sins, our weaknesses, and as Paul says, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Two, that we will no longer aim to seek our own interests and pleasures, but to advance the cause of our Redeemer. Four, that we will no, three, that we will no longer remain in a position where we ever need to help ourselves, when where others have to constantly guard us in the straight and narrow way. Rather, we should resolve by God's empowering grace to put on the whole armor of God, never letting any piece of this divine armory fall along the way, that we may truly be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Let us resolve to consciously and conscientiously place ourselves where our soul's interest will be awakened to do good to others, not evil, to comfort the sorrowful and the sorrowing with the words of scriptures, to strengthen the weak in faith, physically, morally, and spiritually, and to bear your testimony for Christ whenever and wherever opportunity offers, whether to the Jew or to the Greek or to the Gentile, in season or out of season, whether the weather outside is dreadful in winter, summer, spring, or fall. Let us resolve to aim to honor God in everything, always and everywhere, to carry the religion of Christ and the Bible into everything that we do. Let us not only pray and prepare for the future here, but for God's future called eternity with such a zeal as we have not yet manifested in the past. Then let us educate our minds to love the Bible and the testimonies 
instead of all the other books or the e-books or the movies and what have you, to love the prayer meetings and the Bible studies, to love the hour of meditation, to respect and treat our whole body with our minds and hearts and souls or spirit and attitudes as the temple of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And to do nothing in, to do nothing in public or private in thought, word, or deed that will grieve away our guardian recording angels so that we can honestly and fully claim the promise. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivers them. And above all, to love the hour when our soul communes with God in solitude, in peace, in a quiet place, in a private space, far from all cares and woes. Let us become heavenly minded if we plan to finally and eternally unite with that heavenly choir in the mansions above. And thus a new page is now turned in the book of the recording angels. Therefore, let a record be stopped there in our individual books of record. Now passing in review, which we will not be ashamed to have revealed to the gaze of men and angels. May God bless all of us with his power and his grace to meet the new year with a new resolve to please God and please God alone. May God bless you all. Let's turn to Isaiah 56 and read what God revealed to Isaiah so that he could reveal it to his people. Remember, this is not the world, his people. And so it will, if it applied to the people of God in those days, much more so does it apply to God's people in these final days and final hours of earth's probation. It is a clearly thus saith the Lord, it is written. Isaiah 56 says, thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment, do justice, for my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness, my holiness, is to be revealed. And here's the blessing. Blessed is the man that doeth this. That's in verse 1. And the son of man that layeth hold in it. Not merely profession. Is now holding on to it. That keepeth the Sabbath. Not just the day itself but keeping the Sabbath from polluting it and keepeth his hand from doing any evil on the Sabbath day. Neither let the son of the strangers that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus said the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Was the promise? Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place. How is that again? I go to prepare a place for you. We need to go back to the scriptures to see the magnification, the explanation of this place. A place and a name better than of sons and daughters. You would think that is the highest honor. But greater than that is contemplated. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants, every one of them that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. When you say that you're a covenant keeper, a commandment keeper, central to this is not merely keeping the day, but keeping 
it from being polluted and defiled. What is the promise? Even them, all of them that do this, will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in the house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted. Wonderful. Upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. You cannot take away that verse in isolation. It must be quoted in reference to the Sabbath commandment and the call to keep from polluting it. Only then can it be called the house of prayer for all people. The Lord God, which gathereth the outcasts of Israel, saith, Yet will I gather others to him, besides those that are gathered unto him. It's not merely those that have been there the first. There are those that will come in. We're called in the parable of the, uh, of the workers that there are eleven our workers that will be brought in the last days. Then in Isaiah 58, this is the message we are trying to proclaim in response to God's call. And what is his call regarding this topic, this subject? Isaiah 58 says, cry aloud and spare not and lift up thy voice like a trumpet. That's part of the three years messages. And show my people, you can see the world, what? Their transgressions and the house of Jacob, their sins. This is specifically referring to polluting the Sabbath. Yet they seek me daily, that's it, and delight to know my ways as a nation. Talking about the holy nation in Second Peter. That did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. They had all the forms. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, including fasting, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our souls, and thou takest no knowledge? Are you not paying attention to what we're doing? They're saying to God. And what is his response to the prophet? Behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure, or you're pleasing yourselves, not God. And you exact all your labors as though by works we could obtain that righteousness. And so he says, Behold, you fast for strife and debate, and you to smite with a feast of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. What kind of fast does that God require that is acceptable to him? He says, is it such a fast that I have chosen? What fast is this? A day for a man to afflict his soul. And there is a powerful chapter regarding this afflicting of souls. It should be done during the Day of Atonement. And we are living under the antitypical Day of Atonement. It is called the Pre-Advent Investigative Judgment. It says, to afflict your soul, to bow down his head as a bulrush, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him, would thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? Not your fast, but my fast is saying. To loose the bands of wickedness. How many of us are still under bondage? Slaves to appetite. Slaves to lust of the eye and lust of the flesh. And the things of this world. That has to be unloosed. The bands of wickedness to undo the heavy burdens. We buy trouble. That's part of the study we did on how the many ways we deny Christ. We purchase trouble when we shouldn't. We have enough trouble to deal with and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke. Oh, that yoke of bondage 
Uh, we're still under that. That's the Egyptian Babylonian spiritual bondage that we're still controlled by. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, that thou bring the poor that are cast out to the house, when thou seest naked, that thou cover him, that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Shirking responsibility. Then and only then, yes, we just read that earlier, shall thy light break forth as the morning. Arise and shine. And thine health, whoa, the health, the spiritual and physical health, shall spring forth speedily. And thy righteousness, we often talk about Christ's righteousness, we will own it. We will possess it. We will obtain it. And this is how. And thy righteousness shall go before thee. That is how we will witness to Christ and for Christ. We shall be known by what? Not what we say, but basically how we live. That is called the influence, the savor of life unto life. They shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. You shall be covered all around with it. Then... Look at that. Shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee that, that yoke, and, and it says that the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity, you know, you do this way. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, not just by food, the disciples were told to feed the people. They had no money. They were to feed them with spiritual food, the manna. And then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness will become as the noonday. Now here it is, friends. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought. And make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden. Sounds like Eden. And like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. Now here is where the Sabbath commandment comes in, and how to preserve it. Those who do that from polluting it are called the repairers of the bridge. And restorers of the foundation of many generations. It says in verse 12, and they that shall be of this, those that are identified in the previous verses, shall build, not break, not make shipwreck off. They will build the old waste places. They've been wasted by Satan and his agencies. Thou shalt raise up the foundation, foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the bridge. What is the bridge made in the law of God? The fourth commandment. Number one. The restorer of the paths to dwell in. And that is exactly what verse 13 is saying. And we should understand this. And I'll bring in specific references now regarding this. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath. From what? From doing your pleasure on my holy day, and you call the Sabbath delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable. Look at that, holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him. How? By not doing your own ways. And how often we do this, and this will be brought out very soon. Nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then thou shalt delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob, thy father. For the Lord, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, you see, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, even if we religiously and zealously kept or keep or observe the literal seventh day Sabbath of the Bible by ceasing to do secular work and attend church activities and services faithfully and yet pollute 
or defile it as ancient Israel and Judah. It's all over. You read our book of Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah as well. As did ancient Israel and Judah and the Sabbath-keeping Jewish nation in the time of Christ, only to falsely accuse and condemn and crucify the Lord of the Sabbath by polluting the Sabbath? What do we do? We pass judgment on our own selves. Number one, we miserably fail to magnify the law and make it honorable as our example and Savior Jesus did as part of his mission on earth. Number two, we deny our Lord of the Sabbath in another way, as verily as Peter did at Christ, at Christ's trial. Number three, we stand self-condemned, self-deprived from receiving the Lord of the Sabbath's special spiritual blessings that are exclusively inherent in the Sabbath commandment. For it alone bears the insuperscription, the sign, the mark, the seal of his law between the Creator and his only creature that was made in his image and likeness. We read that in Ezekiel 20, 12 and 20. And between the true God and his true worshipers in these last days of earth's very short 6,000 year history so soon to close. Number four, we deprive ourselves of the assured success of the refining work. And yes, it is called the fiery, yet necessary purifying process of sanctification, which is our fitness for heaven that is so vital to the gospel's plan of salvation and goal of character perfection in Christ's holiness and righteousness, which actually makes up the wedding garment that is without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish, verily described in the book of Revelation as the fine white linen, which is the righteousness of the saints. Those who keep the Sabbath day holy today, those who keep the Sabbath as verily as the people of the past kept it. That is, they kept it rigorously, ceremonially, and legalistically, not in spiritual substance and truth will have merely that form of godliness, but they will deny its power thereof. And if they do not awaken and respond quickly to the straight testimony of the true witness to the spirit we look warm, Lay this in church, given in Revelation 3, 14 to 22, and institute the necessary thorough Sabbath reform and not keep the Sabbath day holy, hallowed, sacred, and sanctified. They will certainly fail to finally receive the seal of God in their foreheads. That is called the seal of God's approval of a finished work and project of character perfection in the individual. If they are not sealed, this that seal is called the saint's passport to heaven. If they are not sealed further according to prophecy, as fearfully prophesied, they will eventually join the ranks of the enemy who worship the beast, and his image when the mark of the beast is finally enforced and will become, according to the great controversy, the worst enemies of their former brethren. You ask this question as far as biblical history is concerned. Who were the worst enemies of Jesus Christ? Who were the worst enemies of his disciples and apostles? Now let's just consider a few quotes from the inspired pen of the spirit of prophecy, which is called the, the testimony of Jesus in uh, Revelation 12, 17 and 19, 10. And I want to make sure that this thing is recorded so that none of us will be kept in darkness of ignorance. The light of truth has been brought forward to all of us. Number one, it says, we should jealously guard the edges of the Sabbath. 
Sunset Friday, Sundown Saturday. Remember, as in remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember that every moment, and how often we look at just the worship service or the so-called preaching service. That is not what keeping the day holy means. It is the whole day because every moment is consecrated holy time. So that before the setting of the sun, let the members of the family assemble to read God's word, to sing, and to pray. That's from volume six of the Testimonies for the Church, page 356. Now, on food. You know, the longest uninterrupted miracle in the whole Bible took 40 long years. And what was it all about? Keeping the commandments of God through a food test. It was called the manna test. You can read the whole of Exodus chapter 16 and compare it to the whole Numbers chapter 11. Remember that the first test to the yet sinless and unfallen Adam and Eve was a food test by Satan himself disguised as a serpent. And then they both failed. And so Christ's first of three temptations in the wilderness was on food. Now this, let's consider this. We should not provide for the Sabbath a more liberal supply or a greater variety of food than for other days. Instead of this, the food should be more simple and less should be eaten in order that the mind may be clear and vigorous to comprehend spiritual things. Overeating befogs the brain. The most precious words may be heard but not appreciated because the mind is confused by an improper diet. By overeating on the Sabbath, Many have done more than to dishonor God. God in Christ is the self-denying, self-sacrificing Savior. That's from the same reference, page 356. You know, before I read this pointed yet truth-filled testimonies a long time ago, I used to fill up a potluck with healthy vegetarian food, thinking it was fine. It isn't. Never was, never will, no matter whatever justification may be summoned. And so I have personally chosen, that's my own personal choice, to fast on the Sabbath, partaking only of either fruit or protein or smoothies, whatever it is. That's your choice. Now here's how too many Sabbath keepers today in this silent yet momentous closing hours of probation, where our lives are passing in review in heaven exacerbated by the undisciplined access to cell phones and the internet, polluting the Sabbath on the Sabbath hours, even while in church. And here's the quote. Are you as careful as should, you should be in keeping the Sabbath holy? You have something to do besides laying aside your work and amusements on that day. How often I've seen people in church watching the NBA and sports taking place on Saturday. You have something to do besides laying aside your work and amusements on that day. If you, on that day, the Sabbath, lay plans of what you will do when the Sabbath is passed, that's true, after sunset, or talk of your work, your amusements, or your clothes. You are polluting the Sabbath. But when you're speaking of your hope in God or related subjects in the plan of salvation, of Jesus and his soon coming, and of the beauties of the new earth, not the attractions of the world, that is, you are not speaking your own words. That's what we read in Isaiah. Of these things you may freely speak on the Sabbath. On the sixth day you may talk of business matters, lay plans that are necessary, but the Sabbath is holy time, every second. And so all worldly thoughts must on that day, and that's a day of, that's the day and night of 24 hours, okay? 
it says must be dismissed from your mind. It begins right here. Then the special Sabbath blessing of God will rest upon you. And this is what will happen. You will have the sweet consolation of the Holy Spirit. And you will also have confidence when you approach the throne of grace. That's from the youth instructor, February of 1853. This is also what is meant in let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And what the new covenant comprehends, when God's law is no longer written on two cold tables of lifeless stone, but in the soft and tender flesh, if a truly converted, transformed, new heart, yielded mind, and a willing spirit producing the new man in Christ Jesus. My prayer is that you and I will look on this very carefully so that we are told, as in Hebrews 12, 10 and 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. May God bless us as we carefully consider our lives in view of the light that we just received. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for being patient with us, continually teaching us. We are poor learners, slow learners, as the disciples were, and we're just repeating that. Jesus was grieved many times by their lack of attention and details. So help us, Lord, not to repeat history. Because if we don't learn from that history in the Bible of God's own people, we have condemned ourselves to repeat it. God forbid that that happens. Our hearts must be changed. Our minds must be transformed. That is God's offer in his plan of salvation. May we receive it. May we receive it without question or doubt. And trust God for he can be trusted. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.